hopeful that those people that were not able to join us live, uh, we'll be posting the recording of this uh, hot stove on our website and on our YouTube channel for you to uh, take in anything that you might have missed if you want to see it again. So without further ado, I will uh, introduce uh, Dustin Gabber from Grain Shark. Uh, Dustin owns and operates his own uh, Prairie Grain Shark Prairie Mobile Marketing uh, Company. And uh, he's been, I'm going to say, well known on the speaker circuit throughout Manitoba and Western Canada the last couple of years for reasons of sound marketing advice and being able to simplify complex issues and boil it down to what matters to producers. And uh, I've had the opportunity to, to pay attention to uh, his uh, marketing updates and his uh, recommendations just the last couple months as the market has gone crazy. And uh, it's really opened my eyes up to the simplicity of it. So I thank you, Dustin. And with that, I will turn it over to you, allow you to share your screen and uh, hopefully explain the chaos that's going on in the grain marketing world. All right, I'll do my best to help you out with that. Lots of craziness happening these past few weeks. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen here. I don't have a lot of time, so a lot of this is gonna be quick and I'm gonna go very Cole's notes on it. As you know, with marketing, we can, oh, one second. There we go, you can see my screen now. Marketing can be pretty long-winded. We're always, there's you know, tons of different things affecting prices. So I'm trying to keep it as short as possible. Let's start off with a quick snapshot of what the markets are doing today. We have NOLA down a little bit here. The March contract's down 820 a ton. Um, other contracts not doing as bad. So it's okay considering where we've come from this week, which you'll see on the chart shortly. Uh, wheat prices are doing very well, up double digits today. You have the soybean market doing very well, up 20 cents. Corn's doing very well, is uh, up 18 cents. And oats kind of lagging behind a bit, only up three cents uh, at the moment. So for the most part, pretty good way to finish the week up here, other than that uh, little pullback that we're seeing in the canola market. Okay, let's start with uh, daily canola contract. A lot of what I do on, on the grain shark side of things is following what the chart trends are doing. Uh, we do look at fundamentals, supply and demand, all that other information that's out there. But a lot of what we're looking at is based on historical trend information and uh, chart signals that are showing up uh, throughout, the, throughout the year. So what we're looking at here is a March canola contract. So our daily contract, which is very short term. So you have to remember the difference between a daily and a weekly chart. Our daily chart showing us what's happening over a period of days and our weekly chart, which is uh, showing us action over a period of weeks is kind of more of a medium term outlook. And that's usually what we focus on when we're trying to make decisions on grain sales, uh, where to set targets, how far markets can pull back, all those wonderful things. So canola has been in a pretty steady uptrend. You can see higher highs and higher lows. That's important in making uh, a steady uptrend movement. We had some sell signals uh, two weeks ago on January 15th, made a recommendation to sell another 15% of old crop. At this point, at that point, we were holding on to about 30% of old crop canola and uh, seeing some slight sell signals yesterday. But again, uh, to, just to remember, this is the March contract. So uh, most grain companies will have switched over to the May contracts and July contracts here. Some did this week, and most will by next by the end of next week for sure. So we're not going to act on this sell signal yesterday, uh, given that we already sold some uh, about 10 days ago on this earlier signal into that 690 per ton range. The, the May contract looks pretty much the same, just a different uh, price range. Spread is very uh, inverse right now, meaning the March contract is much higher than the others. Uh, same idea, a series of higher highs and higher lows keeps the market in an uptrend. We can see that we've been challenging this same area between 667 and 680 
the past, uh, well, basically the month of January. Again, we had some, uh, some cell signals in here on the May and we decided to make a 15% recommendation there as well. Uh, still holding on to 15 to 20% of old crop. The jumping ahead to the weekly contract here. And again, this is where a lot of our, uh, our target ranges are gonna be developed. We see um, the markets obviously in a really steep uptrend right now. We have to be careful here because the, as the market goes completely vertical, it has no choice but to start going down at some point. You can't go backwards like this. That's something that's not possible. You can see back here in 2008, a similar type of price action rather than uh, going this way, obviously it, it starts to correct. So that's something we need to be cautious of here as the market tries to move up to these con uh, all time highs of 744.50. So the shortest way to explain it, canola is going to uh, trade between, give opportunities between 695, the highs from 2012, and 744.50, the highs from 2008. And we'll be watching for sell signals to show up in order to uh, capture the best possible upside we can. And in the worst case event on any pullbacks, the market should find good support into this 580 to 610 range. Um, a couple non-chart related type stuff. Well, I guess it's still chart related, more uh, historical trends. The market's only been above uh, 650 per ton twice in, in recent history. You could go back to 1970 and 1974 and in 1980 something there was, there was a spike, but it was kind of irrelevant uh, that at the time you weren't able to actually trade that. So in recent history, canola has been above 650 twice. And the first time was in 2008, that's back here when we have a uh, all time high of 744.50. That was largely because of fund related activity, financial crisis in the US in 2008, sent pretty much all markets through the roof. We had wheat prices trading 25 bucks a bushel, lots of uh, wild stuff happening back then. And then, even more recently in 2012 and 2013, we had canola prices trading above 650 up to as high as around 695. And the reason that's important is because in 2008, the market was fund driven and it only lasted for about five months. In 2012, we were dealing with extremely tight stocks of canola, 588,000 tons, and the market was reacting to supply and demand type information. And that's what kept prices uh, in a higher range above 600 bucks a ton for 15 months. So the point to take from that is we're about halfway through this uh, 15 month cycle if we're gonna go off of seasonal trends. So I think there's still time to uh, enjoy these higher prices and that's going to change once we get bigger production or more stocks of uh, vegetable oil uh, coming in and, and that's likely not till new crops. So. Uh, still some, some good opportunities on the horizon for canola. Some of the fundamental things we're watching, uh, Ag Canada has been reducing stocks. They have stocks down to a million tons. Like I mentioned, they could possibly go down to uh, a record low into that 600,000 ton range. Uh, that's very positive information. You have extreme demand in China right now. They're buying lots of soybeans, using the soybeans for vegetable oil, and then also using the meal to uh, build up their feed reserves. Uh, they've been building up their hog herd ever since they had swine flu come in and destroy, I think it was like 60% of the, or more of, the, of the, the industry. So as that builds, you're seeing this wild demand for feed build. So China's buying soybeans, corn, barley, peas, all types of stuff. And that does very well for pretty much any markets, uh, but specifically canola because of the vegetable oil. South America weather, you have you know, flooding in some areas, destroying crops, you have drought destroying crops. You have recent, yesterday, uh, Malaysia put an export tax on palm oil, trying to keep the palm oil in Malaysia for uh, biofuels. Uh, lots of things happening that, uh, that justify the market staying above this support of 580 to 610. That's the quickest way I could possibly explain canola. Let's jump to 
out of wheat. Wheat's a little bit uh, less exciting right now, but there's still some, some good things happening in the market. <clears throat> Quickly show you the daily chart. Very similar to canola, we've been in an uptrend, just not quite as uh, strong of an uptrend. Higher highs, higher lows. And uh, sell signals have been happening several times in here at this 650 to 660 range. So that's a very important number to keep an eye on. And I'll show you exactly why here as we jump to the long term chart. We can see that uh, wheat prices are moving up to some pretty significant resistance here. Uh, we haven't traded above 660 bushel since uh, about five years ago, four and a half years ago. Um, so that's a pretty significant number. Once prices are able to move above 660, you start looking at uh, this higher range, 750, um, probably more into this kind of $8 range. But that's going to take some help from a couple things. So what we've been recommending is uh, small sales into the resistance of 630 to 660. Similarly to canola, we've, uh, we've recommended up to 80% sold now. Uh, the last sale was 10 days ago there uh, on that peak at 650-ish and then uh, still holding on to 15 to 20 percent of old crop uh, pricing there. I should have mentioned on new crop we have uh, we still we still have some room to sell some more new crop but we're also in that 20 to 25 percent sold range on new crop pricing. Um, so what are some things that can push wheat prices above 660? Well the biggest one is probably Russia's export tax. They just announced this week that they will be uh, approving that. So as of March 1st, there'll be a, I don't know the details on it, but just know there's a tax coming uh, that will probably limit exports out of Russia because it's going to cost more um, to export. As a result, that's going to be good for any foreign interest who's, uh, that includes us, we're foreign to Russia, so uh, we'll be the ones that benefit from that the most. Uh, the last two times that Russia put an export tax in place, I uh, don't have the exact years off the top of my head, but in both of those years, um, they either put a tax on or they actually banned exports completely. Uh, the futures went up to $8 or higher. So that's one big thing to watch. Uh, second thing to watch is the crop conditions. Winter uh, crops aren't doing as great as they could be in some areas. Uh, the Black Sea uh, had poor crop emergence. Uh, they don't have a lot of snow cover, so uh, some threat there. Similar in North America, uh, Europe as well. And China's crop uh, wasn't great after their flooding. Um, they don't really release all the details about that, but I think it's worse than uh, they, they lead on, especially with how much they've been buying. So a couple things to, to keep in mind there as we watch wheat. Selling opportunities are 640 to 660 on the futures and potentially another buck above that if, if things work out right here heading into uh, Feb and March. And this, everything I'm saying on the weekly chart kind of extends over to new crop as well. Uh, quickly here, touch base on a couple others. We look at uh, soybeans. Soybeans are in a significant move higher right now. Actually, today's strength is really nice to see. This is a <clears throat> this is a buy signal right here, telling us that market's probably going to. Uh, go back up and test this high end of 1437 yet. Um, so that's something to keep an eye out for. Let's shrink this up here so you can see what we're looking at. Okay, so the challenge here for beans is getting above what's called a gap area here. You can see there's an area where a space on the chart where there's no uh, price activity. That's, that's an area of resistance that the market's going to have have to prove itself. Uh, once it gets above 1437, we start looking at another dollar higher, uh, 1536 to 1537 as the next target area. So at this point, sitting back, just waiting to see how far this trend can extend. And just like other crops, we are sitting in that same 80% uh, range, kind of sold 15 to 20% left to, to price, and also same 20 to 30% on new crops. So um, in the short term, there's some pretty good opportunities out there for anyone that has no 
grain sold yet, which if you do, hats off, that's pretty awesome. Um, but I think a majority of people are sitting with a, a little bit less than everything at this point. Um, as I mentioned, the Chinese demand is, is mainly what's pushing the market up right now, along with uh, some news and, and some pretty crazy pictures. If you go on Twitter, you'll see uh, South America, some of the crops that are getting destroyed by uh, waterlogged plants and, and they're sprouting in the pods and it's just a nightmare in some areas. Top of, on top of all that, you have Brazil talking about a strike, a truck strike. That could cause a lot of haywire down there, especially as they're heading into harvest. So lots of crazy things happening out there to keep an eye on. You want me to keep going, Laird, or do you want to yeah, see no, uh, another another five minutes if you still have some uh, information? I can I can quickly riff off about canola or, uh, corn here as well. Just one sec, I'll pull up the chart. While you're pulling that up on soybeans, moving forward, you know, looking out eighteen to to twenty four months out, is there a lot of indicators starting to suggest we're going to be dealing with with some of these highs for that far out? Uh, it's pretty hard to go that far out on what I do. I, I like to cap it at uh, six to eight months. Eight months, a lot of things can happen. There's, you know, you're looking at multiple crops coming off in between now and then. Um, so I, I like to take it in steps. But based on previous history, you in, in times of tight stocks, you get about a year window, 15 months window. So it's kind of hard to say for sure. But at this point, I think you're good for for uh, the first part of next crop anyway. So there's there's some good times ahead for next year, I think. But beyond that, it's, you know, I wouldn't be able to give an accurate answer. And anyone that says they can is completely lying to you because 18 months out, if I knew that, I'd be, you know, I'd be filthy rich man, so. But uh, yes, next six months to 68 months, I think we're in good shape on pretty much all markets. Uh, corn joined the party as well. I mean, it's in an uptrend. Uh, you're looking at this first target area, 550 and, uh, or sorry, 520 to 550. We've been making some sales there recently, um, anticipating that if we were to move above this, well, then we start looking at, you know, back into this kind of $7 range, which would be pretty awesome to see. So I'm uh, willing to hold some of it back to see if that happens. But as the volatility increases and as we get higher up in the markets, you have to be uh, uh, willing to hold out for $40 swings in the market or, or just you know, selling along the way to, to keep some peace of mind. So um, yeah, short summary, things are looking good. Canola's got legs to 680 to 700 on the May and July contracts. A new crop, NOV, NOV going to 580 potential. Um, soybeans, another buck upside if we break this 1437, um, and corn, kind of similar story there. So, and wheat, uh, the 660 is the key number, which anyone that follows me or, or subscribes to me will probably get sick of hearing 660 because I mentioned it probably three or four times a week. But uh, in reality, you need that to, before you can stick your neck out and, and suggest that it's going to go any higher. So, yeah, there's my quick little synopsis of things. Anyone, did anyone have any questions? I don't have any questions in the question box and it's uh, pretty quiet from the peanut gallery. So that's- I don't mind that. Yeah, <laughs> it put me on the spot. Nailed it. <laughs> Got a couple in the chat here, Laird. Okay, yeah, here we go. Um, that was seven dollar new crop or old crop corn. Old crop is seven for summer. Uh, when I'm saying seven bucks, I'm talking about the futures price. So uh, cash is completely different. I don't like talking about cash because uh, I work across the entire crop prairie, so it's kind of hard for me to reference it one to one to one. So what happens there is uh, when we make recommendations, it's all based off of futures values. And then when people want to kind of hone into their area, they say, hey, I'm from this area. What's a good cash price for me to target? So 
Um, hearing lots of seven dollars out there in, in parts of Manitoba this uh, this week, and uh, I, like I said, we're still holding uh, our last twenty percent to uh, to see if we can get an extra buck upside in the futures yet. So, right on. John says thanks. No problem, John. <laughs> Got one more question. I have one more question in the chat from Daniel, and that is. Do you just follow the markets or do you play in the markets yourself as well? I do not play in the markets. If you, if you play and give advice, you, you, uh, you become constricted in what you say. You, if, you, if you're trading, it's a little bit more emotion going on. And I've seen that happen in the past where you make the wrong decision on your own end and then you start giving poor advice as a result. So. The answer is no, I do not trade commodities. I do, however, do a lot of uh, stuff with the stock markets using this same, uh, same type of analysis. And I can just quickly show you that even. Just one sec here. So if you click on this one, it shows you uh, stock markets and you can do the same type of trading. Uh, here's an example of, um, of a stock I'm currently in called Plug Power and you can use those same types of techniques to determine uh, your buy and sell points as well. So no to commodities, but yes to, uh, to other things. I also bet on hockey and I lose lots of money that way. So <laughs> Daniel's reply was touche to you. Uh, okay. The, uh, I, I, just as a, as a side note, I'll be uh, curious as to know if you were involved in any of the great shorting that has just taken place through Reddit and uh, uh, GameStop and uh, that's- That's for another day. I've been following it, but yeah. And just, hey, quickly, look at this. Since we since we started in 20 minutes, Canola's bounced back. It's not even, get, it, it closed positive on the May and July. So <laughs> good, good news for you for the end of the end of the week. I have, I have one more question I'm gonna ask you to answer in one minute about oats. Sell them. I think that's the answer that Rick was looking for. No, I, I upside in oat market is about uh, 20 cents from where we are now. And cash prices probably won't reflect that full 20 cents. Um, you know, you're looking at pretty good offers right now versus the cost of storing them to June, July to gain 20 cents to me doesn't make a lot of sense. So we've been, uh, we've been a little bit more aggressive on oats than other crops. Right on. And also so selling some new crop as well. Uh, some pretty good offers for September. Cover minimum amounts that you need to. And then, um, you know, typically you'll see $4 or better uh, after harvest. So not a huge aggression on new crop sales. Very good. Thank you very much. I will uh, get you to just stop uh, sharing your, your screen and we'll turn it over uh, to the next presenter. Uh, hey. Justin, is there uh, a location uh, and a spot that growers can find your contact information if they want to learn more about your services? Best thing to do is go here, grainshark.com. You'll see an area down here you can click on to try the service for a couple of weeks. Fill out the free trial. We'll set you up. You can check it out, see what it's all about. And then, uh, you know, we'll go into the next phase after that if you, if you enjoy what you see. Thank you very much. We appreciate your insight. There you go. Enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thanks again for having me. Thank you very much. Now, next up on the docket, uh, pretty excited to, uh, to introduce Chad Yancheski. Uh, Chad is the RFP Genetics Manitoba uh, rep. And uh, Chad is joining us today and going to be able to give us a 10-minute uh, overview on some of the exciting things that FP Genetic has in the marketplace now and what's coming in the marketplace in the future. So I don't quite see your video on yet, Chad. I'll let you share your video and then you can begin sharing your screen and your presentation. All right. All right, can you, can you see the slide there? You betcha. All right, so yeah, I'm Chad Yancheski. I'm with FP Genetics, so I cover all of Manitoba uh, for FP. Um, 
Uh, so I guess first slide here is just uh, who's who's FP Genetics, and uh, the way we like to talk about uh, our company here is uh, Pachero Seeds is, is FP Genetics. Uh, we're we're owned by more than 160 shareholders uh, in Western Canada, and uh, we're lucky to do so that way because it's when we bring new varieties to market, um, it's Pachuras and other seed growers that are growing them for us. Uh, we're learning through them and. Uh, Really, they're the best people to uh, to converse with their growers on on what's coming uh, down the pipeline and new genetics for uh, for multiple crop types. So uh, when we talk about FP, it's really our shareholders um, that are are the experts in in the seed business for us. So just a quick overview of some of the uh, some of the varieties that we have um, in in wheat. You know, we've got Viewfield Landmark. Um, but one that's launching this year that I'll touch on quickly here is AAC Magnet. Uh, so this is an early segment wheat uh, that we'll be launching now, uh, similar to Redberry that's on the market right now, if anybody's familiar with that. Um, the only difference really between the two varieties is Magnet's got an MR for Fusarium, uh, Redberry's an I for Fusarium. Uh, we had this, uh, I can give an example of field kind of in southern Manitoba we had last year. I was down more in that Killarney area. Uh, yielded same as Brandon, it was 80 bushels, 14.9 uh, protein, uh, but it came in about four days earlier than both Brandon and Viewfield in that area. So um, just a, a play on an earlier wheat and uh, just to, uh, you know, give you a little bit something earlier in, in the harvest cycle there for you. Uh, transitioning out of wheat into oats, uh, we had launched uh, CDC Arberg last year, uh, white milling oat. Uh, we sold out last year uh, on this variety in our launch year. And uh, we're pegged to do the exact same thing here right now. Demand's been uh, really, really good from a miller perspective. So uh, General Mills has full acceptance of it. Grain Millers uh, on their preferred list. Uh, Richardson actually just put on their recommended list uh, about a month ago. And uh, we're in mill runs with Quaker and Emerson milling right now. So uh, the miller demand's been, been very, very high for this variety. Um, it's uh, a taller variety. It's got more straw to it. Um, but it's got high yield potential and spendability is, uh, is excellent. So a very, very good option for, for a new oat that's on the market right now. Uh, another oat that we have, uh, very well known by, uh, by most people in Manitoba would, uh, by far be our biggest oat would be Summit. Uh, it's been on the market. Yeah. For, for quite a while. Um, just short, short, short stature oat that's high yielding, um, good disease package on it and very, very good standability. So. Um, two options of oats that, that do extremely well. Uh, really just depends which, what you're looking for. If you're looking for that shorter oat that's been consistent or a little bit higher yield potential in the Arberg, um, but you're just dealing with uh, quite a bit more straw when it comes to that. There's about six inches or so difference in height uh, going from a summit to an Arberg. Um, on to our pea portfolio. So uh, first variety I'll talk about is chromes. Um, chromes we launched last year in Manitoba. And we had a, a very, uh, very strong um, yield package with this variety and, and a lot of uh, crazy, crazy yields that came off this year uh, with this variety. So uh, in the seed guide, I think it's about four, four or five bushels higher than any, uh, any other variety that's uh, on the market currently. Um, we had <laughs> crazy yield records with this on people's farms this year. Um, you know, in Russell area, we had some that we're averaging 90s on peas, a lot of 80s and, and high 70s uh, with this variety this year. So um, a very, very high yielding pea variety. Um, it's the top yielder in all three prairie provinces. Um, so we've sold, sold a ton of it this year and uh, uh, pegged to have another really good year with it. Uh, the other variety that we're launching this year in 2021 uh, is AAC Profit. Um, so this is uh, another strong variety suited well for the black soil zone. It's um, a little bit less yield potential than what we're seeing in Chrome, um, but still very, very respectable. Uh, the only thing with this one, it's got higher protein content. So when you're putting it up against Chrome, you're gonna get a, a boost in your protein uh, with profit. So a great option, uh, you know, with Merit too, this is another P that, uh, that they've been looking at uh, for their portfolio. And hybrid fall rye, uh, we've been in the hybrid fall rye uh, business for a while here now. Um, new variety that uh, we had kind of a soft launch on last year um, and we'll be going to the market with majority of our seed going forward into the KWS Tribiano. So 
Um, it's a high yielding variety, but it comes with better ergot protection than, than anything uh, we have on the market right now. Um, so good standability with it. Going forward for FP Genetics, we'll be focusing on uh, KWS Bono and uh, Tribiano as well, um, with a big focus going uh, towards the Tribiano with the ergot resistance that's available with this variety. So uh, keep an eye out for uh, four more acres of this in Manitoba as well this year. So that's just a super quick overview uh, in the few minutes I had on, on what we have currently that's out there right now for varieties and our, our different crop types. Um, and I'll kind of touch on a few of the genetics that we acquired last year that's going to be coming uh, in the next couple of years. But uh, before that, I just wanted to share our new naming of varieties. Uh, we kind of look back on how we had named varieties in the past and there was really no um, rhythm to what we were doing and in, in putting varieties out there with names. Uh, so actually, as of yesterday, we publicly announced that we had partnered with the Legion um, and we'll be working on all of our varieties that are coming out now. Uh, going forward, we'll be honoring a veteran that had served for Canada um, at some point in the past. And um, we're going to be going kind of per, uh, per province. So if we're launching a wheat or a pea or a, a barley, whatever it might be in Manitoba, um, if it's a, a product that's fit very well for the province of Manitoba, then we're going to be looking for uh, a veteran that uh, originated or came from from the province of Manitoba and uh, that had some ties here. Um, and we're also looking for someone that's had some ties uh, to the agriculture sector. So on the back of our tech sheets going forward, uh, there'll be obviously the name of the variety, but uh, kind of a little backstory um, as long as the family gives us permission on uh, on who that veteran was and how they have a tie to uh, to you know Canada and the province and uh, and that variety itself. So. Um, the new varieties uh, that I just want to touch on here quick will be three new wheat varieties that we'll be launching. So uh, you'll see AAC Hodge uh, in the seed guide this year, uh, highest yielding in Manitoba and Saskatchewan. It's a, again a VB variety, um, strong yield package on it, uh, good protein on it, uh, standability would be equal to that of a view field, and, um, but a little bit taller so it'll be about eight centimeters taller than Brandon, but uh, but good, very good standability on it. Um, and the disease package on it is uh, is really, really strong. So it's an MR for fusarium and pretty much an R for everything else across the board. So uh, very strong disease package partnered with yield and standability. So we'll have a, have a good fit for that. And that'll be launching in uh, Manitoba here in 2023. Uh, and another one will be AAC Hockley. Um, this is a conventional wheat that'll be launching in 2023 as well. Uh, this will be a variety that we're going to go um, to replace that view field um, Brandon type of acre with um, strong standability. So anyone who had grown view field in the past um, would know the standability on that is, is very strong. Uh, that came in at about a 1.3. This is sitting at a 0 0.7 for a standability rating. So a variety that uh, if you have manure ground or um, just pushing that fertility package on, uh, the breeders are very confident in this variety for, uh, for its standability. Um, good protein on it, good yield package, and it's uh, an MR for fusarium as well, uh, and an MR or an R for all other priority one diseases. And the last one will be BW1093. We don't have uh, a name selected for this one yet, um, but this one is a uh, super high yield potential. Um, what it is is uh, very similar to a, a view field mimic here. It's short leg view field, standability equal to view field. Uh, just quite a bit higher yield potential than view field, but it also comes with an I rating on fusarium. So it uh, just comes down to whether you're looking for uh, yield first or you're, you're worried about that disease package uh, more. Um, we've got lots of new varieties that are coming down the pipeline um, that'll, that'll fit well uh, here in the province of Manitoba. So keep an eye out for them. We'll have tours this summer um, with shareholders and, and some plots uh, around the province that people will be able to check out these varieties going forward. And that is it. It's great, Chad. Thank you very much. Any uh, questions, comments, uh, personal experiences about some of the, the varieties that Chad mentioned uh, from FP Genetics? I've got one in the uh, chat is, how does Arbor Goats handle a more aggressive fertilizer package? For example, 120 plus pounds of nitrogen. So we've had, uh, we've had guys push fertility on that, um, have done well with it. We've had 
lots dabble more so with manipulator on that um, to try and shave off some height on the oats um, and it's worked really well we've had them be able to shave off six inches no problem on that for standability um, to be honest we haven't had issues with it going down um, I've had there's been one one field go down that I've been aware of uh, up where I live up kind of just west here Sandy Lake and uh, but that was more so due to a weather situation of, of uh, winds that came through um, but pretty confident in the standability of it. And, uh, but just look for manipulator again, we've had people with really good success. Um, just check with your end user or wherever you're selling that, those oats to just to make sure that, that that'll be accepted. No, that's, uh, that's great. I think exactly what you alluded to Chad, that uh, Arberg this year, you know, the last couple of years being dry has shown some phenomenal yield. And now moving forward into 2021, with Syngenta's uh, growth regular, regulator modus uh, registered for oats. I think um, if we check in at, at this time next year and ask what we know about being able to push nitrogen on our Arberg oats and maybe accompanying it with a growth regulator, uh, we're gonna be learning lots about the variety in, in 12 months because it is gonna bring that next level of yield to, to the white oat market, I think. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you very much. If, uh, if anyone has uh, any other questions or comment, uh, comments, I know Chad is going to stick around uh, until uh, after we wrap up the formal presentations and can answer any questions in the chat. Uh, he is also uh, getting in contact with any one of us and we'll also get Chad's contact information uh, to you or maybe Chad, if you want, you can share it in the chat below if you have any further questions. Sure. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And, uh, Appreciate appreciate you having the ability to keep your dogs out of this presentation as much as I think it was added to it. It's, it's a little uh, bit nicer, eh? <laughs> it's good to know those baby gates came in handy. So <laughs> thanks. Uh, as you can see, uh, Justine is already ahead of me and uh, ready and raring to go. So I won't give her too much of an introduction because I think she is pretty well known across Manitoba and Western Canada uh, with the role that she has played with the Canadian uh, Canola Council and being the specialist that she is in departments of Blackleg and Verticillium. And I think she's had a busy speaking tour uh, this fall, speaking on Verticillium. So I will let her jump right into some of the challenges producers saw in canola this year. And, uh, and in 20 minutes, we'll wrap up the presentation and uh, I would imagine have some questions for you. So take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Larry. Can you see, you can see my screen already, but can you hear me? Okay. That's that. Every presentation starts off with this now. So, um, but yeah, I'm going to address verticillium stripe for you guys and, and talk just a little bit on the, the yield robbing component that we may have been experiencing last year uh, throughout the growing season. Uh, so just I, like any pathology uh, topic, I need to do the basics uh, and understand what we're working with here. And I'll make sure I can get my little pointer functioning. Um, but yeah, when we're, we're talking about verticillium stripe, it's caused by the species verticillium longisporum. So this was first isolated actually right in your guys's neck of the woods, south of Winnipeg, uh, back in 20, 20, or 2014. Um, and, and that was the first case in Canada found of this particular pathogen. Uh, from there, CFIA completed a really extensive survey and they found it all across Canada, but the first cases were found here in Manitoba. Um, we sure like our canola diseases, so why not add another one to the list? Um, so when we're dealing with this particular pathogen, it, it is a soil-borne fungi, so it's going to work very similar to that of club root. It's going to move in our waterways, in the soil, on equipment, on our boots. Uh, it spreads very, very easily. It is a brassica-specific uh, disease or pathogen, so it is only going to be affecting our, our canola or our, our mustard crops. Um, there is another species that we deal with here in Manitoba called Verticillium dahlia. That is a, a, is a pathogen that affects sunflowers and potatoes. Uh, so for any of, any of the growers that are uh, growing those two crops, they're probably familiar with Verticillium and as a, and as a different species. Um, so when we're referring to the actual disease and, and the symptoms that we're seeing on our canola, it's called Verticillium stripe. Uh, some people do consider it or, or call it Verticillium uh, wilt. Uh, that's the incorrect term because it doesn't actually cause these wilting symptoms that we, we, we see here. Uh, it is more of a stem stri striping or, or stripping type disease um, where you see it uh, really affect the stalks of canola. So to highlight last year, um, just to kind of show that it was a below average uh, 
year for us and, and especially on canola production and and what this graph is showing just over time typically we've been increasing at about a bushel a year um, so back in 2000 we were, were around that 26 bushels and every year we've just kind of been creeping up and on these below normal years which are represented by the red dots um, that's what we're, we're considering you know we're not seeing that increase we're not seeing that one bushel extra so 2020 was actually a below average year for canola our, our uh, Canada-wide average was uh, just over 40 bushels uh, and our Manitoba average was around, I think 41.2, 41.3. So we were actually the, the uh, had the top yield uh, compared to Saskatchewan and Alberta, but still we're not seeing that advancement. So last year was a below average year where typically the last few we've just kind of been average. Um, so, you know, what is holding us back? What What's, you know, causing this? And um, like anything, um, obviously the weather is the wild card and, and the trumping factors, and, and especially when we start looking at disease as well. Uh, but it's interesting to note when you look at the temperatures, what happens in these below average years or these below normal years, typically it's hotter. And, and same, last summer was extremely hot for, for an extended period of time, right? We had really high temperatures in, in early time, so in June and July, um, and where we would see a, an above average yield year or above average uh, yield, is when you have these cooler temperatures, right? Canola is this cool season crop, so it does typically better in, in cooler climates. So uh, that's just one thing to note that we are, you know, we're seeing increases in temperature um, and, and that is taking yield, just that alone and heat stress. And when we look at that, any day over 29.5 degrees Celsius um, is gonna cause stress to the plants. Um, and so Sam, when I look to uh, Red River Valley, right, we're seeing, I think it was up over 15 days above that temperature. So a lot of stress and, and that is causing stress um, to the plants, mainly between that bolting and flowering stage, right into flowering. Um, so we're seeing significant reduction in yield because of that. And so I'm, I'm mentioning all of this, and especially on the heat component, and when we start to look at precipitation, because both of these play a huge effect on the development of verticillium stripe and canola. So when we look at uh, precipitation, same thing. Um, on our below normal years where we're seeing these lower yields, uh, we're not getting the rainfall that's required in the months of, of, of July and August. So that late season moisture uh, where we have really good canola uh, yields is when, is when we're getting uh, rain during those months. And if you think back, um, I'm from the western half of the province where we received upwards of 15 inches on what was it, July 1st pretty well, and then the taps turned off. Uh, no further rain pretty well the rest of July and August, and, and that really did impact our canola. So why I'm mentioning all of this when talking about verticillium is this, uh, the environment here in Manitoba in particular is, is really conclusive for disease development. Um, so what verticillium longisporum needs to get going and moving in the soil is really warm soil temperatures. Um, and, and we had enough, uh, you know, uh, subsoil moisture there to get you know our crops established and also to get the disease moving. So within the soil this disease is then taken up by the roots and as soon as we get soil temperatures over 15 degrees uh, that's when this pathogen starts really moving into the plants and it's easy to easily colonizing within the, the actual plant itself um, and then it thrives in hot dry conditions. So we look to the last you know, three or four years in Manitoba, um, we, we've had those hot dry conditions, especially July and August, um, and we're starting to see a lot more of, of verticillium stripes. So this is not only a Red River Valley issue, this is seen all across Manitoba now, uh, and we're, we're really starting to see it ramp up and in 2020 really um, proved how uh, significant this disease could be. So just a quick life cycle, and I'm not going to focus heavily on this, but what goes on um, is, is the pathogens in our soil, right? Soil-borne disease. Uh, so it, it's staying there in our soil, and, and it's uh, staying in a dormant phase called the microsclerotia. And the microsclerotia um, are similar to that of like a sclerotia body for sclerotinia, right? They're these hard fruiting structures uh, that can stay in that soil for a really long time. And uh, in Europe, where this disease is very uh, prominent, they find that the microsclerotia can live in the soil for upwards of 15 years. So they're going to be there and they're going to be there for a really long time. In the spring, when the soil temperatures are there, that moves up into the roots and then it starts to move up into the vascular tissue or moves through the vascular tissue of the plant into the stem. 
And from there, it starts to cause this stem striping or stripping away where the stalk itself becomes very fragile. Uh, it can cause plants to uh, lodge, it can cause them to prematurely ripen, pod drop, uh, different pieces like that or, or, what, or what are the symptoms that we're gonna be seeing. So this has probably been here for much longer than the, the six years, seven years that we've uh, known about it. Um, this is something that has probably been here for, for quite some time, but we weren't looking for it at the appropriate timing. So this image that I'm showing here is actually um, from a crop uh, in October, so about a month after harvest. And you can see this gray pepper-like, and it's almost like a, a powder across the, this residue. Um, and, and this is the Microscorotia of verticillium. Um, so it's on the, the, the stalk itself, very fragile. It's almost straw-like, they'll break. They're, that's how fragile they are. Uh, when you cut into the root tissue stain, you'll see this gray speckling across that cross section. And, and that's really um, the, the, the true sign that you are dealing with verticillium stripe um, when you see that microscrotia. So last season, um, was the kind of the big year where we noticed this was making an impact, uh, right? Like it was obvious, it was noticeable, it was noticeable in August, so fairly early. Um, and we don't have yield loss numbers yet here in Canada. It, it's something that we're working on. So we're relying on a lot of the European literature to base, you know, the potential uh, losses that we might be seeing. Uh, and a lot of the European work saying there's a huge variation there. They report anywhere of upwards of like 10 to 50% yield loss. Um, and so it, it's very, it's a very inconsistent disease and sometimes can be very insignificant, you know, just not enough there to cause much, much disease at all. Um, so same, there's, there's a lot of factors at play in, in the, the environment being the real wild card there, right? It needs that hot, dry conditions for the disease to really cause damage. Uh, one thing that's kind of positive to note, any of the work that's done on, on the damage of the plants, um, the disease itself is not causing an impact to the oil content or the composition of the, the proteins, the fatty, ad, fat, fatty acids, um, or the glucosinolates. So that's a really key piece when we think about marketing this crop, right? It, it's not causing any issue to that um, seed or oil profile. So symptoms, this is kind of where we are at, um, where we're still learning how to identify this in the field, how to compare it to other diseases. And, and so I'm just going to work through the next few slides here, just showing what to be looking for. Um, there's a lot of confusion with it with other diseases, and it's probably why it was so easily misdiagnosed in the past and, and why it's probably been here for such a long time. We just weren't able to separate it off from other diseases. Um, but really the, the, what we're looking for earlier on in the season is, is the stem senescence or half stem senescence where half of that plant doesn't look right. Um, I'm gonna show just some images of the early season symptoms. We don't typically see these here in, Man or in Canada. Um, any of the fields that I've been to or suspect fields, uh, you just don't really notice this yet. Um, but same, you ha would have this half stem or half leaf senescence where you've got discoloration or, or leaf chlorosis going on. Um, yeah, like I said, not something that we've been easily able to identify. The mild symptoms, and, and this is what we're seeing a lot of this year. Uh, so we've got the stem senescence occurring. We've got the microscrotia starting to form. As soon as I see microscrotia de developing, then I know it's actually verticillium. Um, if I'm just seeing beige stalks, sometimes it looks like sclerotinia. Sometimes, or especially in these hot, dry years, it just looks like a dried out plant or something that's been uh, heat stressed. So a uh, little difficult that way. So th this is what we're trying to train our eye to be looking for in the field. Um, this image here, same, so we've got nice green looking plants, green stalks, and then we had plants with the half stem senescing. So you can see these are pulled from the same field, same day, just the difference in, in plant architecture overall. Um, the pods on here, a lot of them have already started to shell out. Um, that's how, um, how damaging it, it was. Um, the other piece, and this is where I first started noticing verticillium, was trying to do black leg ratings. Um, and I was getting this gray discoloration right across the root tissue. So going through cutting the root tissue, and, and this is what I was seeing. And, and this is not characteristic of black leg. Um, so you've got, got this gray discoloration or haloing effect that's occurring in the root tissue itself. And once it starts to advance, you can start to see the gray speckling. So the microscrotia is starting to form. Uh, here's just a few different images of the stem senescing that I'm referring to. Um, so at your typical, what I would call your canola disease surveying time, so 60% seed color change or, or right prior to swathing um, is, is when we typically rate for diseases. 
I, I think verisilin was probably confused or misdiagnosed with sclerotinia a lot of the time. We would get these really beige, fragile stems. They weren't necessarily always, or producing microsclerotia. And right, if I'm not seeing the microsclerotia, it's tough to tell what's actually going on. So this is early in the development where the microsclerotia still haven't formed. Um, and, and same on a normal year, this would just maybe look like a little bit of heat stress or, or drought stress or, or sun scald on the plants, not super obvious. Same thing, this is a, was a field that was left uh, to be straight cut and you can this really see the um, severity in that half stem senescence. So the one side is, is perfectly green and the other side dried right down. Same whole plant, when you move up it, uh, there's about two or three branches there that are still green. Uh, and the other half of the plant is, is showing that half stem senescence and you've got a bunch of pod drop and shattering occurring. Uh, the microsclerotia, same, not always obvious when we're typically in the field. They're a lot easier to see later on post-harvest. Um, so same, you, right, you just have this beige discoloration and you actually have to peel back the outer layer for the microsclerotia to show through. Um, so they are hidden below. And, and this is where the, like, the plants are almost straw, like very fragile. Uh, when you pull them out of the ground, they almost shred in your hands. So that outer stem layer pretty well shreds off. And that's where you'll see the tiny little microsclerotia growing uh, beneath the surface. Uh, and then the comparisons, uh, right? It's just training our eye, right? We're, we're still at the point of uh, properly diagnosing it in the field and, and knowing what we're working with. Uh, so same, right? The verticillium with the microsclerotia, very, very small. Um, there's no feel to them. Like I said, it's almost like powder. Where in comparison to a disease like black leg, the, the pycnidia or the pseudothesia, the fruiting bodies on there, you can feel them. They're pepper-like um, and, and you can rub your hand across that and actually feel them. Uh, and in comparison to the cross-section pieces there, right, you can see how black leg has the, the really uh, predominant spots that are visible there in comparison to the gray effect seen right across the tissue. And saying just so a head to head comparison here of sclerotinia, right? You can see how very similar they look with the shredding of that outer layer of that stem, very fragile plants, where with the verticillium, if far enough advanced, you will start to get the growth of the, the microsclerotia underneath that layer. So as, as for management, um, like I said, it's a new disease here. We don't know a lot about it. Um, so there's not a lot of options available. And, and we, we are taking everything that we know out of the European situation and how they're working with it. But to, to date right now in Canada, we have no preventative or um, curative effects from any sort of fungicide products. So there's no fund or foliar, there's no seed treatments. Um, over in Europe, they're just starting to play with a seed treatment that would help kind of protect the root system from um, from the microsclerotia invading it. So that's a brand new product and, and saying we haven't actually seen how effective it can be yet over in Europe. Um, like any management practice or disease management approach, right, just controlling your weeds, your volunteer canola being that, uh, that biggest weed in the off years. Um, and, and what happens there is, right, it just acts as a host or as a reservoir for that disease to continue its life cycle and keep producing more microsclerotia into your soil. So good weed management falls into all of these. Um, within our Canadian germplasm right now, what, what we know and don't know is that we are seeing differences within hybrids. Uh, so we think there's some sort of quantitative resistance there that's allowing some hybrids uh, to not get as severely infected. Uh, so same, there's nothing standard yet. The, the industry's hoping to develop a severity rating scale so they can actually um, mark their, their hybrids performance um, in comparison to susceptible and resistant stuff. So uh, it's something that hopefully within a few years we'll have a better idea of what hybrids are gonna stand up to this disease. Um, and let's see, a yeah, soil-borne disease. I, I mentioned this earlier, they live in the soil for a really, really long time. Um, and we're not really willing to extend our crop rotations to, you know, 10 plus years for canola crops. So looking at other options, you know, equipment sanitation, I know is a Debbie Downer, but just even once a year trying to minimize the spread uh, and just having an overall biosecurity uh, plan on your farm. So like I said, it, it's a little grim right now and, and I promise we, we are working on it. So just wanted to highlight two projects. Actually, we've got three. Uh, one of them is a yield loss product that is um, a project that's funded by the canola grower organizations. Uh, these other two are federal funded. 
Um, and they're looking to answer a lot of the unknowns right now. So these, both of these projects are on year three of five. So it's coming and, and hopefully we'll have more to share with people. Um, but right now it, it really is just looking at identifying it and, and knowing that, you know, you're dealing with verticillium versus black light because you do have other options in some of these diseases. So um, like I said, it, it's looking grim right now, but it's in motion and, and hopefully we have more, more to share in the upcoming years about this particular disease. So. I will uh, yeah, conclude with that. And if you've got any further questions at all or, or looking for images or uh, detail, there's a lot of this up on the Canola Council website. So hopefully sometime soon we'll be able to get a handle on it. Thank you very much, Justine. That's, uh, that's a lot of information. And if there's anything I've learned here, there's a couple things. One, it's I'm gonna need a new pair of contacts come July. And number two, I don't think I've ever seen a picture of a canola plant in the back of a pickup truck with as clean of back of pickup truck as yours was there. So that's pretty impressive. <laughs> hey, uh, I sanitized every time. So <laughs> yeah, I think there's I think there's a few producers on this call that uh, could could pay attention to that. But um, one question I had is is in Europe, what kind of yield as as they're a little farther progressed on the research side of things, what kind of yield hits in terms of a percentage are they seeing in some of their canola crops where they can isolate verticillium being the, the yield robber? Yeah, so in, in Manitoba, I heard lots of mixed uh, comments on the type of yield loss they were seeing. And, and you know, up in the Swan River Valley, they were reporting 10% losses and, and contributing that solely to verticillium. So same, that's just coffee shop talk and, and the, the preliminary work um, that's coming out of the University of Alberta, same, they're kind of in that five to 10 range. Uh, it really depends on how much inoculum is actually in the field. So it's a, once again, a numbers game. Um, and what we've been doing within these hot, dry years, we've continued to build it up and it's gonna spread really easily. And actually a bunch of these plants that I've shown today were on canola crops that were really good rotation. So one every four or five years. Uh, so that's kind of the alarming thing here is, you know, you can be doing everything right, but just the nature of it, we're, we're harvesting right when all the Michaelis grocer are up in the stem. So you're coating the combine, it's going up in the wind, it is gonna spread like wildfire and, and, and it has, right? It is right across Manitoba. Interesting. So if producers are in the field and they're, they're walking their fields and they think they're identifying uh, verticillium, what's the, the corrective action or what's the next steps they should take to properly diagnose it? And, and uh, is there labs that they can send samples away to identify it in the lab. Yeah, yeah, and actually, you know what, I should have thrown that slide in for you guys. Um, this is something that your team can do for them is submit samples. Um, so any members of the Manitoba Canola Growers Association, uh, they've opened up free testing through the Pest Surveillance Initiative Lab in Winnipeg. Um, so what happens is a, as a grower has to just get their number and then you can submit samples um, on their behalf or growers can do it themselves. And, and what happens is you need to send, I think, eight or nine different uh, stems that you think are showing the disease. And they'll be able to confirm, yes, you're, they're able to isolate off the, the species, which is causing verticillium stripes. So that verticillium longisporum. Uh, they also have a black leg race ID test, and a club root, um, club root spore test and glyphosate resistant kochia test. So definitely make use of that program. And, and Laird, I can send you guys the link for that as well. Um, might as well make use of free program because usually those tests are about 100 to $200 a piece. So That's great. Thank you very much. And, and the only, uh, I guess it's more of a comment I see in the text box below and it's the next, this is from John. And I think that we have four different customers that I'm thinking of that could start with the name John. So I can't pinpoint which John this is and call you out for it. But the next Patura competition is who has the most stuff in their box. So um, that would be that would be an interesting one. I know uh, I did see a guy by the name of Rick on this call, and I think he might be in contention to win that one. So I'll just leave it there. But uh, thank you very much, Justine. We appreciate that information and, uh, and appreciate you jumping on the call with us. So with that being said, uh, thank you to everyone who stuck with us through this uh, rapid presentation, rapid hour of information. Uh, we hope it was time well served for you. And, uh, and if you have any questions about it, uh, reach out to us. We'll get you connected with the expert uh, that presented today in each of their fields. So 
Um, thank you again to the presenters. It's, it's really you guys that uh, are, are allowing us to benefit from your information and from your expertise. Um, the second component of this is when we originally started coming up with different ideas at Paturas to increase some, some networking and some inter information sharing uh, through what we thought might be a long and cold winter, uh, one of the ideas was a coffee shop. And so I guess at the end of the day, I want to invite everyone on this call. You're welcome to stick on, uh, grab another coffee, grab a beverage of choice that you would be drinking on a Friday afternoon. Uh, the, the Petura staff are going to stick around and we can have some so-called coffee shop networking, uh, if you would like, that would be taking place outside of a, of a boardroom. So uh, feel free to stay on and uh, have some conversation and some dialogue. And then I also want to leave you with um, uh, the fact that, so this is the first of three series of these uh, rapid fire presentations, um, all egg hot stove information sessions. So the second one we have on February 26th, that is again the last Friday of February, and the third one is the last February of March, uh, March 26th as well. So uh, please keep that in your calendar. Uh, we're going to be sending out a short survey to everyone who is on. I just want to pick, pick your brain on some feedback on what you liked about it, what you didn't like, and most importantly, what you want to hear about in the next couple uh, sessions, because uh, I want to hear from you and we can line up the speakers of whatever expert they are in whatever field you have a question for. So uh, your feedback is very important to us. It'll be a quick 10 question, multiple choice uh, survey to, to send back to us. And if you can do that, I would really appreciate that. So with that being said, I'll wrap up the formal part of the meeting. Thank you for the adap adaptation of technology and joining us uh, from wherever you are. And uh, hope you stay warm and have yourself a good weekend. And I'll stop recording now so you can say whatever you want.